Tracy tells me there are several people with their hands up and that I just happen to be first. I'm not taking the prerogative of the chair. But my question relates to your closing statement and one that Mai said earlier in hers, and that is this issue of measurement. Um, so I, I, I would give it I would give it to both you and Mai. Mai, you said there are sufficient measures. Bob, I think most of your talk outlined that we're not measuring what really matters if if those the first of the three C's are going down um, because they are really not measured in any way currently. And I just wonder if both of you could speak to this issue of measurement since it's a, an intensive focus for us. Yeah, so do you want to... I'm, I'm happy to start, Bob. I, I don't think Bob and I disagree. Um, I, I, I think I tried to make the point that we are not measuring the things that are most meaningful. There are some practical hurdles to doing that. Collecting proms is resource intensive. It is not something that clinicians enjoy doing, even though they keep asking for those metrics. Um, and at the same time, they're, they're also at a macro level tends to be um, a race to the lowest common denominator. By which I mean that while everyone would like all payers and everyone, every measurement organization that is trying to collect the data to be as aligned as possible, um, that tends to not favor the organizations pushing the envelope and trying to build the most evolved measurement system that is more streamlined, that is burdensome, that is more meaningful. That tends to not work well with alignment. So you kind of have to pick which would you rather have, um, you know, payers who are pushing that um, or, or everyone aligned on a lower common denominator? Uh, I would make a uh, separate kind of a point, which is my, my concern is less with performance measurement than what it's being used for. I think we now have about 15 years experience with pay for performance across many countries, uh, including the U.S., and it actually doesn't work very well. And especially for health professionals, it probably compromises intrinsic motivation and converts uh, professionals into people who respond to narrow financial incentives for a particular set of measures. So I don't think MIPS or related approaches to try to reward physicians for what the payers think they should be doing is, is a successful policy strategy. There's some role for using measures for public reporting. Um, but again, we haven't figured out what the core measure set might be that uh, that patients would use for that. I think uh, patient experience measures is probably um, where that should be, uh, where the emphasis should be. But the basic point I want to make is that measurement for quality improvement, most of which may never be public, is where we should be devoting our efforts. Um, and we should try to restructure the health system so that organizations or maybe down to the individual physician practice level have incentives and requirements to uh, engage in quality improvement activities and, in fact, uh, develop uh, measures that would work in that, for that purpose, which is very different for, than the purpose of public reporting and pay for performance. Can I just, um, can I just, it's not a rebuttal to Bob, but to round out the conversation there, I will just say, there, you know, we can have that conversation. I think it's important to have that conversation about the use of quality measurement, but we need to acknowledge the other set of stakeholders at the table for that, which are patients and purchasers who feel very strongly that there needs to be some kind of quality accountability. Until that cultural shift happens, I, I think we're going to, you know, be living with the expectation that there is some accountability in terms of performance. government's responsibility anyway should try to protect uh, beneficiaries, the consumers from substandard care and not think it can distinguish between fair, good, and, and excellent care. And we should do a better job of, of, of protecting the public rather than trying to make those nuanced judgments. But that is a whole discussion that could take place. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Rebecca Etz is up first, and then Chris Kohler after Rebecca. So um, I had two questions. I, I really appreciate the presentations. Um, uh, not surprisingly, Maya, I, I have a question about measures. Um, the 
Uh, I'm very interested in patient measures, um, patient reported measures, and I'm very interested in quality measures. Thinking about accountability is a, is a tough one for me. A lot of um, the accountability conversation so far, not in this group right now, but in general, has caused, uh, it seems like, a, a narrowing or reducing of responsibility among clinicians. They limit their panel, and then they become accountable for what's going on with their patient panel, as opposed to being accountable for the health of the communities in which they're located. Um, I'm curious about, uh, for you, um, the kinds of measures that uh, you feel would allow purchasers to get the information they need um, to understand how uh, primary care is doing. Um, so in addition to the patient measures, um, and uh, maybe it's the same or maybe it's separate from clinical measures, but what would be the key things that purchasers would want to know to understand um, whether they're getting a, a good product, essentially? Um, and just so we don't have to flip back to me after I've asked questions um, for Bob, I, I want to make sure I heard you correctly because it seemed as though you were saying primary care does not do, does not handle most needs for most people because look, they're only paid 7% of the national health expenditure. And, and I wonder if some of the data you're using to describe what primary care does now um, is, is not a helpful direction. Um, if we are underpaid and undermeasured, then looking at the end of payment doesn't necessarily say what we do, nor does it then suggest that specialists provide the majority of care simply because they spend the most money. Uh, so those are my questions. Uh, do you want me to go first, Bob? Or... Sure. So, uh, you know, um, let's set aside government purchasers for a second and talk about private purchasers. Um, I have dreamt, suffocated at the prospect of being able to give our clients metrics like days absent from work, amount of EAP resources used, metrics of distress, um, or even employees that leave their job because their clinical lives or their home lives are just so stressful that they're willing to incur that risk. Um, you know, I think about that for, for example, parents of autistic kids. Um, so, so yes, I completely agree with you. I, I think as, um, you know, perhaps I should just be more explicit, implicit in my, in my entire presentation, but I should make more explicit is these are all negotiations. They are multi-party, multi-directional negotiations between providers, patients, purchasers, and insurers. And I think where we trip up is that all those entities are hardly ever in the same room at the same time, at the right point in time in policymaking and execution. Um, and, and that's the challenge. So when we talk about having the difficult conversations, it is, you know, not everybody feels comfortable having uh, uh, patients in the room where you're discussing quality metrics. But I will tell you that at CMS, the original MSSP set of metrics was 64 measures long, largely because of advocacy from consumer groups. Um, and, you know, and today at Anthem, we're talking about a program where you pick nine metrics from the menu, which I think is still too many, um, but at least they are outcome metrics. So there, there are all kinds of difficult negotiations that need to happen in a much more explicit, structured way. Chris, you're next. So this is a question for both my and Bob. Thank you to all three of those, uh, to all three of you. Um, and, and maybe Carrie, you can 
chime, jump in if you want. But I'd like to take Bob's observation that when he goes through the proposed primary care expectations, he posits that there's more coordination and complexity and less comprehensiveness. That strikes me as being pretty close actually to the vision that Christine Bechtel was pitching to us first, that primary care ought to be in the relationship business and focusing on the people who could most benefit from those relationships. So can you envision a, a future for primary care that uh, is more focused on the needs of fewer people who could benefit from the coordination and complexity that Bob talked about and that the um, other folk and, and, and people kind of self-select into that. And if a minute clinic or a telemedicine relationship works for them at a certain stage in their life, that's great. But as they approach these uh, greater complexities, that's where they need the kind of stuff that the expertise that primary care offer, to, uh, the primary care expectations that Bob was talking about was offering. So I'm, I'm kind of, I'm trying to connect the dots there. Um, thank you. Yes, I, I, in fact, um, I, I think that many payers are starting to grapple with this now about how you tailor a primary care product, if you will, to different segments of patients and, and customers. Um, acknowledging that there are different archetypes of patients with different needs at different life stages. Absolutely. I, I wanted to also underscore that I think there is um, there's a, a positive and an upside to uh, Bob's interpretation of where we are. I think there is an opportunity for those primary care practices that want to practice more comprehensively to do so under the right payment and regulatory context. We're trying to offer that in Anthem through our reimagined primary care program, where we actually set out metrics of comprehensiveness of care, of scope of practice. The more you do of that scope, the less referring out for arrhythmia or dizziness, um, the more we'll pay you. So I think there are those opportunities there and in the right communities under the right settings, primary care can pursue that. But I do think this focus on relationships and really on the patients who need primary care most, it's not just the relationships. I wanna to underscore too that there's tremendous um, intellectual capital in the integrative problem solving, integrative diagnostic and problem solving that primary care does that is severely undervalued. It is not something that a digital tool or a machine learning tool can solve. You really, you really can't solve for that with AI and a remote consult to a cardiologist, how to help someone who is having trouble because of cognitive decline and chronic illness and family concerns can't be done. There is no machine yet smart enough to do that. That actually requires an integrative brain at work. So I just wanted to underscore that too. But to just respond to the last question where I didn't have a chance to respond is I do agree that we should be increasing the uh, proportion of payment that goes to primary care, uh, but mostly because their responsibilities in based in the in their primary care practice have increased uh, pretty dramatically, and we need to adequately support that. Uh, but I'm accepting the fact that other specialists will act as principal care physicians uh, for many conditions, for many reasons. One of which is that the the uh, the knowledge gap or the perceived knowledge gap is is large and increasing as we get more nuanced in how to care for uh, many, many conditions. Uh, and so the focus of primary care practices should be based about relationships. I agree completely with that. The term I used in my slide was the navigator of the healthcare system. That's the navigator to other physicians, to facilities, but it's also the navigator through insurance options to some extent, uh, through certainly the social services, once we figure out how to integrate social services and, and health care, I see the primary care physician or the primary care clinician better uh, as, the, uh, as the 
central focus of that. I, while I'm, I'm arguing we just de facto were sort of losing com- clinical comprehensiveness, I would hate to give up the idea that primary care practices are the first contact. Um, and so I think um, uh, physicians have to have play a much primary care physicians and nurse practitioners need to play a much stronger role in knowing what's going on with their patients in the hospital. Maybe that can be one of the benefits of this new use of video conferencing of Skype and all of that. I don't see any reason why primary care uh, practitioners should have nothing to do with their patients in the hospital. They're responsible for getting them there, and they're responsible for picking them up when they come out. I think we can do a better job in that area. But uh, but what they have unique, uh, uh, what what is unique is their relationship. Uh, should a 23 year old who has an occasional urinary tract infection go to a mini clinic? Fine, I have no problems with that. But for a large portion of the population, I think having a stable, long-term relationship with a primary care practice made up of a team, physicians, uh, nurse cl- uh, clinicians, et cetera, is probably the way to go. Tracy, who's next? Uh, actually, right now, we don't have anyone queued up. Um, I also see uh, Kara Walker's back, so I don't know if anyone had specific questions for her. Kara, I, I have a question. So. I liked how you laid out needing a, a vision for primary care and to make sure that it became the focus as a foundation. Um, I, I know in Delaware you, you you laid out how you staged it so that the first requirement was to measure what was currently being paid to primary care, and the second was then to set the threshold. Um, what, and I've, I've heard you talk about some, but I wanted the committee to hear how – how were you able to convince your state to do that process? Um, and I know, and I know you've advised other states on it. And I know Chris was very successful in Rhode Island in getting there. But um, how can we help make that case as an option uh, for other states? How can we help convince them that this is a a not just viable but valuable option? Uh, I think that the conversation has to start around um, total health care spend. I think without a conversation around that, it's very difficult to focus on on costs in primary care and the concept of primary care because um, physicians and others who are who are providing uh, high quality primary care want to be part of that definition and part of the problem solving. But it was it was very clear that some of the question was very much um, fundamental around what do we mean by primary care, and we were a state that didn't engage in, in uh, patient centered medical home legislation or other um, uh, fundamental pilot work that other states have done, and I think again that just showed that we had a lot more work to do to make sure we had an engaged and robust conversation around uh, those who had felt maybe they were on the fringes. So having a place for independent, not necessarily mobilized and organized um, docs and nurse practitioners and physicians assistants to come together was critically important. Our state was, again, poised because we were talking about um, costs and what primary care meant because of our work around the benchmark and because of our work around defining these quality measures. You can't get to better health and lower rates of diabetes or obesity or high blood pressure control without an engaged uh, primary care community. And so that allowed us to focus on how you get there. But these questions about what does the workforce of tomorrow look like? How do you train for it? How do you provide care for very complex um, older individuals who are growing in numbers in our state, I think was a a very real concern that we tried to um, put into the conversation so that people could see there are trends, uh, that we are aging, and that we really need to figure out how uh, to invest in important areas, but the state was 
was in a crisis. And I think it's unfortunate to be <laughs> having these conversations, but you can't let a, a good crisis go to waste. COVID, we're in the middle of it. We are going to need to rebuild our healthcare system uh, in many ways. And this is showing our weaknesses. I think this is, again, a way to just bring people together and make sure we're supporting a healthcare workforce that's robust and able to adapt. And um, one, more, one more reason for us to have these conversations. Thanks, Bob. Hi, so as soon as I made that announcement, a bunch of hands went up. So I know we're running out of time. So I think we can get to, to one or two. So um, Hector and then Carrie Cola. So I'm working on the integrated care chapter with my colleagues. And one of the things that's clear is that when we look at international comparisons, um, we have like the lowest uh, duration of physician-patient relationships compared to other industrialized countries. And one of the things that struck me in all the presentations, the discussion of comprehensiveness, this tension that we have, that we can't really provide comprehensive care to everyone, and nor do ever, does everybody really want it. Um, but part of Starfield's, I think, um, reason for comprehensiveness is that people are dynamic, and they change over time in the course of their lives, and they, some, and they will uh, end up maybe not needing uh, extensive coordinated care or comprehensive care in time one, but in time two, they will. And so one thing we know is that our health system doesn't do care transitions very well at all, like changing people from pediatrics or adolescents to adults or moving complex adults to geriatric care and those sorts of things. So what I am concerned about uh, is moving away from the far field conceptualization of comprehensiveness towards one that is like adapting to our maldistribution of primary care. Uh, and I do think there's risks in um, generating more transitions um, for, of responsibility across the life course. And so I do wonder the perspective of the panelists on this issue of we're creating more transitions if we allow, uh, if we kind of open this idea that retail care could be okay at one point in your life uh, and not in another. So it invokes this idea of more transitions and handoffs um, over the life course. And is that what we really intend? How do we do this without creating more problems, I guess? So can I just say, I don't know that it's up to the clinicians to decide that. Um, okay. Seeing people vote with their feet when they go look for other modalities of care that does not mean, for example, though, that a, a primary care group can't offer its own minute clinic and then have that as an inflow of new continuity patients. But the only other way to battle that trend, if the committee thinks that it's not healthy, is to offer a sticky experience and to present primary care as something other than a commodity. Right now, it has commodity status until you have chronic illness. And my, I guess my point basically is I'll, I'll just, I, it, it had to do with uh, my own condition. I mean, I had chronic low back pain for decades. It then got uh, severe began to develop neurologic symptoms in my lower extremities. And my primary care physician has, you know, ordered, a, finally, I, I passed my six week, actually passed the 50 year threshold for having low back pain before I got my MRI. And it showed that I had chronic spinal stenosis. It's a very common problem. Um, he referred me to a physiatrist, and that physiatrist became my principal care physician for that condition. And one of his advantages over the primary care physician is that he gets to do injections. Um, and he also knows the, the uh, surgeons and who to go to and who not to go to on a much more practical, informed basis than my primary care physician does. And so... Um, so I think we need to spend a lot of time uh, uh, figuring out uh, better referrals, more informed referrals as to who to refer to. Uh, we need to be having not necessarily co-management of patients, uh, but rather uh, better communication and information flow between specialists and primary care. The primary care should be the, my home 
where this information is all maintained. And as I suggested earlier, uh, for those patients who have six or eight or 10 conditions and are on 12 or 14 medications, they may be the best place to sort out what's going on with the patient. Uh, but I just think it, the, what's happening just for, for various reasons is that it just in the system, uh, well, the pick up my thing is I preferred to have my care managed with my physiatrist, not with my primary care physician, uh, because he's a generalist. He is not a specialist on that condition. And so I think along with many patients, that's what they would opt for. This is Kara. I think from the patient perspective, they want the right care wherever they can receive it. And, and certainly this is showing us that we can adapt in primary care to use telehealth and telemedicine to use phone visits to more appropriately and safely manage people. And then to triage into those complex issues, that longer in-person visit. Um, and, and so I think we're going to have to evolve where the Minute Clinic could be the right place in time, but it is for simpler issues that can be managed appropriately in a convenient way that patients feel like they're receiving high quality care. And there is some linkage back to that manager of the complexity so that if there are clues along the way of a higher level diagnosis, they aren't missed, but we don't necessarily have that continuum in place. Um, and we certainly need to continue to think about how virtual medicine is keeping people at home longer. And we continue to leverage the, the home health space in a different way. And I'm cer certain that, you know, technology is going to continue to evolve to allow us to have accurate vital signs and other laboratory tests at our fingertips, but it, it certainly is changing rapidly. I would encourage the committee to invite a, a firm like Heal Health to come and present about their model, where you can see in action a disruptor, one who is trying to present primary care um, in a way that begins as a commodity in the beginning of a relationship, but that rapidly builds into something much deeper, more meaningful at the point of care, which is in the patient's home. just as one alternative vision. Tracy, we have time for one more quick question. Um, actually, I think we're, we're out of time and uh, I've been in touch with the people in the queue. And so we're gonna set, follow up with the speakers separately if they have uh, follow-up questions. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take a break uh, until one o'clock, but please come back bef before one o'clock and get back on. And, and again, for the public, um, we'll be holding your questions till 2.30 after we've finished all of the panels. Uh, but you have that opportunity in, your, in, the, in the box of the webinar to uh, send us questions in the meantime.